Hello fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish and welcome back to another day of Jane Austen July. Today I want to chat all about Jane Austen and cards and card games. Cards and card games are definitely a mechanism that Jane uses a lot throughout her works. And she uses cards and card games to both divide her characters into different groups and to join people together. So it's a mechanism she uses to isolate people within a crowd so that her characters can have the privacy to discuss things and talk to each other without any breach of protocol or respectability in the time period. So for example, Wickham and Elizabeth are able to have a conversation in Pride and Prejudice because they are playing a card game. The card game in essence gives Wickham the ability to discuss personal matters with Elizabeth and divulge the history of Mr. Darcy, which of course leads Elizabeth further into her prejudices of Mr. Darcy and his character. I also love the way that Jane uses specific games to show certain elements of her characters. So if you were writing a book today and you wanted to put a game in there, you would have to pick which game you wanted to place very carefully. If you said that a group of people were playing Monopoly, it would have very different connotations than if they were playing strip poker, for example. The games that the characters play and prefer and how they act towards the game they're playing says something about them as a character. There's that scene where Elizabeth is staying with the Bingleys and she is taking care of Jane who is ill of course and she walks in and everyone is playing cards and she does not want to play cards. You know, everyone jokes about the reasoning why she doesn't want to play cards. She prefers reading to playing cards and they're in essence making fun of her. But in reality, Elizabeth does not want to play cards because they are playing a game called Lou. And that game is a gambling game. And it's the sort of gambling game that is really only suitable for people who aren't worried about money. And Elizabeth does not have the financial luxury to play Lou. In essence, it is setting her apart from the rest of the party and showing her financial situation. And people during Jane Austen's time would have realized that. Just as somebody from today's time, if a group of people were playing strip poker and somebody did not want to play strip poker, would you know, think certain things about them, maybe that they were prudish or maybe that they didn't want to strip in front of other people. You know, that says something about a person. Just as Elizabeth not wanting to play Lou says something about her and her situation. So there's lots of really interesting things that happen during cards and I'm really excited because I now own a very special Jane Austen deck of cards. I'm really excited and I couldn't wait to open it with you guys. So here we go. So this is really fun. Each suit actually represents a book, but of course there are only four suits. So there are two books that are not represented here. Also, can we take a moment to appreciate the artwork on the back of this card and all the cards for that matter. Gorgeous. So. The books that are covered here are arguably the four most famous of Jane Austen's works, and those are Persuasion, Emma, Sense and Sensibility, and Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> the Joker, of course, is William Collins. I don't think there's a better Joker card that I could possibly think of, and I am so happy with this right now. So the first suit we have is Spades, and that's Persuasion. We've got Walter Elliott as the ace face card and we have some wonderful persuasion quotes on two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then the other face cards, the Jack is James Bennick. The Queen is, of course, the main character, Anne Elliott. And the King is our main male protagonist, love interest, Frederick Wentworth. So, so far we've got a pattern of the ace is the father, the jack is the sort of potential love interest that didn't end up being, the queen is the leading lady, and the king is 
the hero of the story. Moving along to the hearts, Pride and Prejudice. Love that it's the suit of hearts because it is considered, I think, well, okay, it's not actually the most, most romantic. I think Persuasion is the most romantic. But when people think of Pride and Prejudice, I feel like they think it's super romantic. So anyway, um, the ace is Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, the parental figures here. We have some great quotes for the numbers. Of course, the two of hearts is a beautiful quote. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. The very beginning of the book for number two. I love it. And then let's see if we keep with the theme. The Jack is Charles Bingley. I suppose he's a second love interest, sort of a missed love interest. Not really. Kind of goes off theme with that one. But I like that Mr. Collins was actually the Joker, so it works for me. The Queen is Elizabeth Bennet, our leading lady. The King is, of course, Fitzwilliam Darcy, no surprise there. And then we are on to Emma. Emma is the clubs, the clovers. We've got the father, Henry Woodhouse, as the ace. I love the number two card as well. I always deserve the best treatment because I never put up with any other. So very Emma. The Jack, we have the alternate love interest, Frank Churchill. The queen, Emma Woodhouse, of course. And the king, George Knightley. Love it. And then we have Sense and Sensibility. Now I'm really interested in seeing how Sense and Sensibility follows this pattern or breaks from it because of the kind of second character. There really isn't a main character in Sense and Sensibility. It's the two characters. So we'll figure that out. Yeah, the ace is not a parental figure. It's Eleanor Dashwood. Although one could argue that with her sense, she in some ways is a parental figure as well. And then we have the Jack, who is Edward Ferrers, the Queen, Marianne Dashwood, and the King, Colonel Brandon. Although it says Mr. Brandon. So yeah, I guess Sense and Sensibility didn't really follow the traditional format because it has those two main characters and instead they just did the love interests of the two main characters for the face cards. But that's okay. I really enjoyed looking through these cards and I can't wait to learn to play something. So I thought it would be fun to play a card game from the Regency era and I was doing research and looking things up. I really wanted to play Whist but it's a four person game and it's usually just me and my husband. I did get together with Heather from Fresh Parchment and we tried to put a game of Piquette together but what happened was we just read the instructions, got really confused, and ended up eating a lot of chocolate chips. So no footage on that for you. But I ended up landing on cribbage. I feel like it's a game that possibly I could learn to play. So I've been experimenting on apps with it, and I think I've finally gotten the rules down at least well enough to teach someone else. So. I'm going to teach my husband to play cribbage. Cribbage most notably features in Mansfield Park, where after a really eventful ball, Lady Bertram asks Fanny to fetch the cards to keep her awake, and they end up playing cribbage into the wee hours of the night. So I'm all ready to teach my husband some cribbage. I have the Jane Austen cards here, and you also need a crib board to play cribbage. I do not have a crib board, but I downloaded an app that is a crib board. So I have a digital crib board here, and I will just put that off to the side so that we can keep score. So what we do is we each get six cards. Three, four, five, six each, great. Okay. And then we turn one this way. Okay, so six of diamonds is our card. Do I look at these cards? You do look at these cards, okay. yes. Look at them yourself and choose two cards to put in the quote-unquote crib. I don't think I was supposed to flip one over yet until we put the cards in the crib, sorry. What so, criteria would make me choose a card to put it in the crib? Um, it's kind of hard to explain. Just pick two cards to put in the crib and okay. I will... Uh, explain it. Okay. I guess I'll be the dealer first, so I'll have the crib first, if that's okay with you. Sure. So, put two cards in the crib. Alright, great. So we'll look at those later. Now we're going to flip over a card. So it, the card is a jack of clubs, and so go ahead and put down 
put down a card. Okay. <laughs> I know you don't know how to play, honey. Don't worry about you it. You are swindling me. All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, so it's a nine. Um, so what you're trying to do is either get a pair um, or 15, and we play back and forth until we get to 31. You want 31 exactly. You can't go over 31. So I can do 19. Go ahead. And we want to get to 31? Mm-hmm. Okay. What are face cards? Face cards are all 10, except for ace, which is one. Okay. 29. 31. Okay, so that means I get a point because I got to 31. Mm -hmm. And yeah, keep going. Put down a card. Okay, five. Five is not a good one to put down because chances are someone has a face card. So 15, I also get a point. Um, and then go ahead, you put down your card. 16, 17, 18, 19. Okay, we're done. I got the last card, so I put down, a, I got a point. So, so far I have three points. Um, now we go back and we look at the hands we had and we do some math and see who has the most points to put on the crib board. I think you have the most points to put on the crib board. Well, you never know because you have all the Nothing. cards in your hand. <laughs> no, no, the cards in your hand. So, um, which cards did you put down? And which cards did I put down? Oh, I was not keeping and track. And then there's my crib as well, which can get me some points. So the crib that we put the cards aside can also get me points. So this card here is used when tallying your hand. Okay, so these were our hands. So let's do the math. Okay, so you get two points for having a combination of 15 with the jack and the five. You also have another combination of 15 with the king that's in your hand and the five. So you have four points. So I actually had no points in my hand, um, but I got three points from playing the game. And then there's the crib that I have an opportunity to get points from as well. So I got absolutely no points because there's no combinations of 15, there's no runs, cards in order, and there's no uh, duplicate pairs of cards here. But I do get some points for the crib. I get plus two for the pair of fours, and I get plus three for the straight, the jack, queen, king. So that means I have five points from my crib and three points for the gameplay. So, so far I have eight points and you have how many, honey? Do you get points based on comparing your hand to the crib or just your hand to the shown card and the crib to the shown card? So you get to use your shown card as part of this to make points with. Mm -hmm. Same with yours, mm -hmm. same with the crib. I just had the uh, advantage of having a crib this turn because I was the dealer. So now it's like we play again. A hand. It's like having a second hand. But now you are going to get a crib for the next round. Okay. So what do you think, honey? You ready for a second round? You'll have the crib this time. How do you know that? <laughs> we alternate who gets the crib. Okay. So we each have six cards. And I'm going to pick two cards to put in your crib this time. All right, so let's flip over the card. It's an eight of clubs. So I'll go first because whoever doesn't have the crib goes first. Seven. So 13. 19, but I get a point because that's two in a row of sixes. 22. 26. 29. Do I get a point because their number is next to each other? They're not next to each other. It needs to be three in a row next to each other. Okay. So that's no, you don't. But I can't go now, so you get a point. Why can you not go? Because my card in my hand would put us over 31. Okay, so I get a point. So you get a point. These all go away. I'll put down mine, so that's 10. 20. 20. Okay, great. So let's... Count up the hands. Oh wait, there's your crib too. Why don't you flip over your crib? So that's your crib. You actually have three in a row there, that's great. I do. So let's see, which cards were mine and which cards were yours? All right, so we have the crib in the middle 
and both of our cards on the sides there. Let's do some math. So the crib scoring, you get four points for your crib because you have a straight, which is eight through jack. Eight, nine, ten, jack. For your hand, you have two points. You have the three of hearts and the three of diamonds making a pair. So I get five points for my hand. We have two points for in 15, the eight and the seven make 15. And we have a plus three for a straight, six through eight, six, seven, and then eight over there. So that's how we play the game. I'm actually having a really difficult time keeping score with the pegboard as opposed to an app that kind of just does it for me. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I think that's kind of necessary to play the game. Yeah. Unless I... you're a Regency era lord. Yeah, I think so. I guess we should stop for now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So that is all I have for you guys today. I had a lot of fun thinking about cards and specifically exploring my new Jane Austen deck of cards because it's kind of a really cool Jane Austen thing to have since cards play such a prominent role in Jane Austen's books. This also was kind of inspired by a chapter in What Matters in Jane Austen by John Mullen. There is an entire chapter on games, card games, and other games in Jane Austen, specifically called What Games Do Characters Play? And like I said, he mostly focuses on card games, but there's also an entire section all about Emma and the word game that they play. So I would love to know in the comments down below what is your favorite scene in any Austen novel where the characters play cards and why is that your favorite? Until next time, I look forward to seeing you in another video very soon. Bye!